Hey, this is Ray Alder from Fate's Warning, and you're listening to The Progcast. Hello everyone, this is uh, Rune, your host here at the podcast this time, and I'm very lucky uh, this episode because I have none other than the legendary vocalist from uh, Fate's Warning, Ray Alder, with me. Hello. How are you, Ray? I'm good. I'm, I'm sure you're busy with, uh, with uh, talking to people about your new album that's going to be out on November 6th, Long Day, Good Night. It's the... 13th release for Fate's Warning, right? Yeah, the 13th album. The longest one we've ever done, actually, yeah. 13 album, 13 songs. Almost uh, almost an hour and 15 minutes or something like that. 73 minutes. It's yeah, a long pe- one. People are, are, are already, <laughs> have already been able to, to listen to a couple songs because you released a couple singles, like, right? Uh, Scar, yeah. Scars yeah. and No Comes the Rain is the two. Have you had, what is the feedback on that? Uh, are you happy about uh, what, what the yeah, fans are thinking? So far, so far, so good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everyone, uh, you know, I, I go ahead and do a little trolling now and then see what people say but uh <laughs> it looks like uh, you know scars was uh people uh, it sounds like you know some from theories or something and you know i think that uh they uh, they really like the uh, now comes the rain a bit better because it's just different it's a lot different than things we've done before so i think a, a lot of times different is is good you know i think also i think our fans who are amazing tend to understand uh, that, you know, every album we do is a little bit different. I think they're used to that. I think it's something that they expect, you know, from us. Um, and uh, hopefully we, we delivered on that like, for them again. Yeah. You know, I, I wanted to, to mention that because, of course, I've, I'm lucky enough to have listened to the album in preparation for writing a review. And... Cool. It's it's very very uh, you know it's very var- vari- varied uh, album. It seems yeah. to be touching on so many aspects, you know, both of the musical history of, of Fate's Warning, but also it seems to me you are sort of venturing into some territories you haven't explored before. Is like is was this intentional or something that happened during the writing process or? I think. Um it's probably a question more directed towards Jim since he's the, the composer. But I mean, I can say that when we began writing the album, um, Jim originally sent me three songs and he's like, just pick one and, and start with that and we'll move on. It's great. And, uh, those songs were pretty different. I think it was, uh, um, we walk alone. I think I can't remember the titles now. Alone, alone we walk. I, I can't yeah, believe yeah. It. that's what. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, that one had. I was. It's funny because I was just looking last night, and um, because I have to do an interview where they want to talk about each track specifically see, yeah. with with Apple Music. So I'm going through the lyrics and the songs, and and they all on my computer. Everything that was from the de- demo stage everything has different names mm. and I'm just going, wait a minute, what this song was called something else. One was called home. One was called, yeah. Um, the long walk is actually now one of the working titles. So anyway, Oh, well, that was one of the first songs that I worked on. And then as Jim was, you know, sending me more music, he would now and then send me something and say, uh, you know, I'm I'm not sure about this one. I'm not quite sure if this will fit with the rest of the album. But you know, let's give it a shot and uh, see where it takes us. And um, a lot of the times, we would just you know sort of fall in love with the song, especially after working on it for a few weeks. Um, and then you know, we just kind of decided that different, I think, would be better once we decided to have 13 songs on the album. Because originally we also, you know, thought maybe we'll just, you know, do a couple of songs for a bonus CD, uh, because that's 
uh, what a lot of record companies do now in order to sell limited edition or you know some sort of digit pack or european or something or japanese but then we just decided let's just it's our 13th album let's do 13 songs and uh i think the the idea of having a lot of different styles of music on this one album would probably benefit the listener hopefully so they don't just get bored you know hearing the same tempo and degree of of, of i don't know aggression or whatever you would want to call it but yeah. Uh, so yeah we we decided to just change things up a bit and i think the album you know goes up and down uh you know in a good way and um hopefully we got the sequencing right but that was a big problem too like trying to figure out how to sequence 13 songs which goes where what goes that was that was a nightmare <laughs> but uh, hopefully we got it right. Hopefully. Well, I can imagine because, like you say, it is so varied. You know, the 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 album, and even within the tracks, you know, I was I've, I've been like listening over and over to the longest shadow of the day, which is yeah. the, the longest track of the album. Uh, I would say <laughs> the it's longest a, song of the album. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's it's quite a quite a it's a, a little masterpiece there for me, and even within that track, you know. The the starting part seems almost like something that could have been on one of uh, Matteo's solo projects, and then you have like a, a a much more heavy part, and it ends up with this amazing guitar solo. I I guess that's Ab Abdo who's uh, who who plays yeah, that. So, yeah, I think yeah. I it's, Mike does three solos on that song, I think. Yeah, but it's 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 so just within one track, you know. You visit so many different uh, <laughs> like territories of music. It's it's just very interesting. So yeah, I can imagine There's to, to, saxophone to, even. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah. that's something as well I wanted to ask about because you have some very like uh, interesting guests on the album, right? You have yeah. Gavin Harrison is is guesting you guys on one song. And then you have yeah. a, a, a violinist and a cellist uh, that's Raphael Vainroth Brown on the cello and Micah Posen on violin, mm -hmm. and and Michael Abdov plays a lot of solos in, on the album, right? So so how yeah. did all this come together? How did you find these these people and, and get them into the project here for? Well, for the, the string section, that was uh, for Under the Sun. That was uh, Jim's idea, of course. I think, again, Jim is a composer. He comes up with all these great ideas. And uh, when when we first started writing Under the Sun, it was actually a small piece of, I believe it was, for The Longest Shadow of the Day. It was sort of just a, a brief interlude, uh, the acoustic part, the intro of Under the Sun. And Jim just sent it to me one day and said, you know, what do you think of this? as a song he's like i think it's kind of cool maybe you know you could put some a melody to it and see what happens and i did and and we both said, okay yeah this is a great song let's add a chorus let's let's work on the bridge and and then he said you know i'm gonna add some strings to it i'm you know originally it had keyboard parts um just as the string idea and he said yeah i'm gonna get an actual string uh section to do this mm -hmm song so that was his idea and it ended up kind of great i think the idea originally was for it to just be in the intro but it ended up being throughout the song and i think it it, it was a great idea in the way that it adds so much color to the song i think than than had it not been there like i can't even imagine the song without it now yeah but, i agree um, it's such a beautiful track and and uh, strings add it, so much much to it it really yeah. does it makes it i think it makes it that much more special and it just adds a great vibe to it just such a i don't know it's, uh, to me it's perfect but uh and then for um when snow falls was it was one of the last songs that we wrote and again, that was another one that Jim was like, I'm not sure if it'll fit on the album. Maybe it's a bonus CD kind of thing. Yeah. But, you know, we worked on it again for so long. Well, for so long, like two or three weeks. And it, we really, really liked the song. It said, it has to go on the album. It's just different. But uh, at that point, you know, the whole COVID thing was coming down and, and our schedule was, you know, in order to have the album done at a certain time, at, so it would be out this year, um, you know, Bobby was still working on his drum parts for the rest of the other songs. And we didn't know 
if the song would make it, if Bobby would have enough time to do the drums on it mm. um, in order for us to make the schedule. So Jim uh, decided to ask Gavin if he would uh, be interested in doing the drum tracks for it, and he agreed, and I think he did a, a great job with it. Um, and again, it's it's one of those songs that I think is very different from the rest of the album. I think it's really different from the rest of the album. Um, but I think that's what makes it so special, personally. Yeah, yeah. Um, I once, hope people dig it. Once again, I have to agree. I, I have to say that, you know, the album is very varied as a whole. And when this song comes on, you can sort of hear the, the different approach of, of Gav, Gavin versus Bobby. So once again, something that lifts the album. And uh, and of course, there's a lot. Yeah. Of, there's a lot of great solos from Michael Abdo. He's he's been with you as a live uh, performer for quite a bit, right? Yeah, yeah. God, I can't even remember now. Six years or so, if not longer, he's been with us and a great addition to us. I mean, uh, I remember originally we looked at other different guitar players, and we settled on Mike. And I think it was a a really good decision on our part. He fits really well with us. We all have a great time on the road and um and his playing is stellar he adds a lot to the music and um you know frank arresti's solos weren't that easy and mike pulls them off you know with a plum he does a great job and especially you know uh, you know he adds a more technical aspect i think to his solos yeah, on the exactly, on yeah. Fate's warning jim is more of a melody sort of driven uh, and again, Mike, no, nothing to say Mike is not, but his is more technical, more, I don't know, I want to say guitar hero-y, but, uh, <laughs> you know, he knows his stuff and, uh, he adds a lot to the music. Yeah. But Jim, you know, people ask like, well, why didn't Frank play on the album? You know, and I, and Jim did a lot of solos on this album. I'm, I'm really amazed how many solos he did on this album because normally he hates doing solos. It's just not his thing, you know, but, uh, he did a great job as well. And then with Mike filling in, you know, there was, uh, I mean, we just couldn't do an album full of solos. If we'd asked no. Frank, <laughs> were, it probably would have just been too much, you know, but, uh, so that's the reason uh, we didn't ask Frank this time because Jim did most of them himself and Mike filled in the rest. I think total Mike did, I think, five solos on the whole album and three of those are in um, The Longest Shadow of the Day. Uh, fantastic stuff. And I have yeah. to say that's also something with, with uh, duality between the, the styles, as you mentioned, with Mike and Jim. It it's adds a lot to the to the album and, and you worked with Mike with on your solo album of course yeah. as well that was released just about a year year ago right uh, what the world yeah was. almost yeah. almost a year to the day i forget when it, my wife is the one that actually told me you know your album came out a year ago <laughs> fuck really it's already been a year like time has been going by so fast man and I know it seems slow with everybody else, you know, the whole COVID thing, everyone's stuck at home and doing shit. But for me, it just seems like, you know, working on the Fates album and, and, and getting all that together, uh, it just seems like time has gone by so fast for us. But um, that was a lot of fun doing it with Mike, you know. And originally, I started working with Tony Hernando here in Spain, and um, he started getting busy with his band, uh, Lords of Black. And uh, I know I wanted to get the solo album done. You know, I had some ideas and Mike, I think we're on the road. And Mike said, yeah, you're working on a solo album. And uh, let me know if you want me to contribute. You know, if, and I was like, yeah, absolutely. So he sent me some music and I love this stuff. Really cool, original stuff. Um, just, uh, you know, again, just uh, all around great guy and great writer, great composer, great guitar player. So I was lucky to have him on the solo album. It, um Hopefully we can do another one one of these days. And maybe with the way things are going now and no live shows, maybe that's something that's more possible now than ever. Who yeah. knows? I wanted to ask uh, about that, actually, because, of course, it's difficult for a lot of artists now with the current pandemic situation. So did that like influence the, the, the work you did on this album in any way, you know, either by creating difficulties for you guys, influencing the themes or anything not really i mean there was a one of the songs excuse me one of the songs of the album actually the last song when when jim sent that to me he was like you know this is i know it's kind of a weird guitar part but you know work on it and see what happens and um 
so I started, you know, writing melodies to that. And then I, I was like, we were discussing lyrics, you know. He's like, what do you want to do lyrically? I'm like, I have no clue, man. I really, you know. And we thought, well, maybe we should do something about this whole COVID thing, being in lockdown. So the lyrics actually started there. I still have the the virtual sort of roadmap of lyrics in there. They're all saved. And it was basically about the whole COVID thing and being in lockdown, the empty streets and whatnot. And, and uh, we just sort of changed it because we thought it's a little cliche and figured that a lot of other people are probably going to be doing the same thing. And we didn't want to really yeah. jump on that bandwagon so we changed everything in the lyrics but that was the only thing that um that almost influenced a song on the album mm. but other than that it was just schedules you know um in america ev- you know everyone is locked down we're all working from home nowadays it's, that's how it is we don't really go to real studios anymore except me i go to an actual studio because i I hate recording myself. I just, it's just too much. You know, I don't want to have to push buttons and worry about editing. And I just, I'd rather have someone, you know, I just want to sing. Yeah. Focus on the, you take care of that. Yeah. Yeah. You do all all this stuff. You, you, you stay in there. Um, no, so I'm not, I'm not a rock star at all, but I just don't, it doesn't work that way for me. You know, demos are fine because I don't know, care what they sound like. No one's ever going to hear them, you know, but, um, that, uh, that was the problem for me was that uh, Spain was under a, a big lockdown. That was yeah. the huge lockdown that was here when no one could leave your house. And, you know, standing in line outside the grocery store for for, for an hour to mm. get something, you know. Um, and this was right near the end of the lockdown. It was just about to end. And, and one of the things you could do uh, legally here is move. So I moved. I moved to the studio. That was, you know, like I couldn't oh. go to work, but, <laughs> but I could move. Yeah. So I moved, and uh, I lived up. You know, I lived there. I, I lived, slept in the vocal booth. I uh, ate microwave food, and uh, for two weeks, and you know, it was, um, it was crazy. Even while I was in the studio, just to go out to the grocery store was was like a nightmare. You had a change yeah. of clothes inside the house or inside the studio. So when you leave, you come back, you change your clothes at the door, you bleach everything. And, uh, yeah, but it was two weeks of, of just vocal, you know, just singing, just, you know, I had one day off the whole time I was there. And all I did was write lyrics. Cause I wasn't finished with one song yet. Um, glass houses actually was the one that was the last one that I wrote, but it, it was, it was a little scary because as I was singing, the songs as soon as i was finished we'd send the files to joe barisi and he would mix so he was mixing the album while i was recording the Mm. vocals which was the first for us absolutely a first for us um and the pressure was on that uh you know if i had lost my voice or if i got sick uh then the whole schedule would have been screwed because joe barisi was on a tight schedule himself he was going to start avenged sevenfold so you know i had to make sure that i didn't over sing and that everything was was fine and it but it worked out in the end and um time eventually was on our side and we were able to finish the album um in time to come out in november yeah which well, is I read, hopefully a good thing I, i read somewhere that you recorded 13 tracks in 12 days Sounds like quite a challenge, and and like you say, you know that for your voice and for everything, you know that had to be quite quite a pressure on you, yeah. It was. I mean, for me, normally, you know, I could kind of take my time. I mean, for theories, it was, you know, I forget how long it took, but I was recording with Joey uh, Vera in LA, and um, you know, I had some time. If something had gone wrong, we would have been fine as far as the mix. You know, if I had to take a day or two off extra, you know, it would have been fine. But it would have been a disaster if that happened this time. Because, yeah. you know, it's not like I could just come and go as I please to the studio. Um, as well as for the engineer, you know, we were just kind of trapped. So, it again, it worked out. We were able to have the album out um, coming out in a, in a week or so. But, you know, again, hopefully that's a good thing because, you know, obviously everybody knows that there's no touring right now. That nobody can tour. So musicians are really getting hit hard because that's 
our our main source of our income is touring. You know, we're we're traveling t-shirt salesmen. Of you course, know, that's course, what we yeah. do. You know, and if we don't have that income, all we can do is write or you know, I don't know. God forbid, get a real job. <laughs> you know, so um, which it, even is kind of impossible now. <laughs> yeah, it, it's 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 incredibly difficult you know we've been talking to a lot of musicians and and i know you can just see how difficult it has been for them this this period and and uh, how much of their you know the foundation of their income and everything just fell away uh, during this yeah. Uh, pandemic yeah i mean i i i don't know many people that can take you know a year off or so and 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 still continue the way that they are you know it's not many people that just not work for a year exactly and yeah still have your home and and you know your car and your family you know it's yeah. um it's it's really hitting musicians really really hard but you know thank god for record companies um hopefully they're doing okay you know people are have nothing else well they have other things to do but you know people are looking forward to new music And record companies are there, and they're willing to, you know, uh, front bands. You know, I mean, there's bands that are doing, and artists that are doing solo gigs now. They're doing, uh, you know, uh, just I don't know, just partnering up with other people, writing, writing material. Yeah. Bands are writing new music. You know, so we have we have, we have been talking about that. That uh, you know, uh, this has been a, sh a shit year for for most of us, but for <laughs> progressive metal and progressive rock and the kind of music that we sort of feature at the prog space, it's been quite a good year. There, there's been <laughs> a lot of stuff coming out, and and you like you mentioned, you know, like projects, people working together. I guess it's opening up possibilities that wouldn't have been there in a touring year so to speak yeah exactly i mean there's that one positive thing is that you know the, all this new music is coming out i imagine in 2021 there's going to be a flood of new music that's going to be so much new music because we have nothing else to fucking do except write music <laughs> you know and if that can put food on the table you know um then so be it and hopefully everyone will be happy in the end when this whole thing clears up you know and then, and then you also have you know because when we did the album before this whole thing hit we decided you know we, we're gonna do the album and we'll go on the road you know they're just like every other time and when theories came out we were on tour i think the two days after the album came out yeah maybe even the same day um and that was the plan for this but <laughs> that didn't happen no so um you know hopefully you know it's 13 songs it's, it's 73 minutes of music people will have time to to soak it all in and, and when the road when we're able to go back on the road then uh you know they'll know the songs very well hopefully but then like i was gonna say i got off the subject i know i talked a lot but the the as far as live concerts you have all those other bands that still have to honor those tickets of those cans those concerts that were canceled exactly yeah so, so they're going to be the first ones out and then there's going to be a line of all the other bands wanting to go on the road with their new music that just came out so uh, whenever this does clear up hopefully in summer of 2021 there's going to be you know a flood yeah. of live shows that's what um, i'm hoping as well and i think you know the yeah. audience is going to be very hungry as well you know everybody has been missing their yeah. favorite bands festivals gigs and you're just gonna go out and experience as much as you can when it when it's back to hopefully normal uh oh, sometime yeah. during 2021 yeah. yeah yeah exactly yeah, yeah i mean some of the festivals i don't know how you know that's crazy you, you, hellfest and 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 fuck in and I don't even know what's going on with those. Exactly, uh, but, all uh, those enormous festivals also, you know, had to cancel. That European, and, yeah. yeah, that Europe is known for. That people, you know, save up an entire year to go to one of these things. You know, like I went to Hellfest with my wife before. We had a blast, man. We had a great time. But I said, I'm not camping. 
<laughs> we're staying in a hotel. I, I'm not, I, I'm not I, totally, sleep I totally understand you. Having yeah. done like Vacken and Dynamo, and that's actually the first time I saw you guys. That was Dynamo in 98, I believe. Or Wow, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. you know, now I'm like, you know, if I'm going anywhere, I, I want a room. <laughs> yeah, a yeah. Room with a shower. So I totally yeah. get that. Well, I, wanted to, nice I wanted to ask you a little <laughs> bit about the, um, the lyrical content, because having been a, a longtime fan, it seems... You know, the the lyrics you write is always very emotional, a bit melancholic. There seems to be a glimmer of hope in everything. And it's like very about human relations. And, and what inspires you to write these types of lyrics? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm the actual human experience, I guess. I don't know. I, I, <clears throat> I try to, I don't know, be a bit more ambiguous when I write my lyrics. Maybe a little more... Uh, cryptic, so to speak. I, I don't want to be so obvious. Um, I, I do like poetry a yeah. lot, where um, where you're as the reader, you're reading these words, and to you, it means to you what it means to you, not what the writer is trying to convey to you. You know, you come up with your own interpretation of what the poem means obviously there's a lot of uh, there's an underlying meaning but to a lot of people it's different so i try to find that same i'm obviously not a poet i'm just not that good a writer i wish i were but it, to me i i just try to paint a sort of a picture like a, a that somebody can come up with their own story i mean yeah i, I use a lot of visuals rain and clouds and darkness and and try to you know try to i guess paint a a vague picture of what people can feel but i think for me i like the positive side of lyrics even if they do seem a little melancholy or dark at some points i think to me they're more of a um it's a positive message it really is a lot of the lyrics uh, some of the songs deal with you know change and and accepting the change and uh you know and to make it so easy say you know things are bad now but they'll get better yeah you know things things will always get better i try to have a positive message in my lyrics um most of the time but uh uh, that was, that was Fate's warning uh, has always exception. had that that kind of uh, you know the the sun finally breaking through the heavy clouds or s some kind of style to me. And I wouldn't sell myself yeah. short. I wouldn't, being you, I wouldn't sell myself short as a poet because you know I've been listening to you guys forever, and those lyrics that meant something to me on parallels or perfect symmetry when I <clears> listen to them at another point in my life, suddenly they take on new meanings. So I, I, yeah. think there's a, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of good poetry in, in the lyrics of Fate's Warning. Yeah. Jim, I think Jim is a great writer. I think Jim is actually an, an exceptional writer. I, I love his lyrics. I always have. So when I started writing lyrics, it was, it was really scary for me because you know, it's, it's like trying to fill some big shoes and Fate's Warning fans are, 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 you know, I, I, I would imagine, I mean, they're very intelligent people and they, they like what they like and I, they loved Jim's lyrics. So for me to take that on was a lot of pressure for me, you know, um, and I do my best, but, you know, uh, again, uh, having to explain a song to people sometimes mm. is just really annoying to me. Like, like I, I would, again, I would rather the listener come up with their own interpretation of exactly. what it means. It's not, but, it's, uh, it's not meant to be overly analyzed from your side and explained to the, the listener. It's, it's, it's an experience for, for him as well. Yeah, right? yeah. exactly. It's, we don't really write love songs, you know? So, I mean, those are pretty obvious <laughs> usually. <laughs> well, of course. Um, but uh, yeah, that's just how I see things. Yeah. personally you know what I, I'm, I'm gonna have to ask because i feel like keep hearing rumors at almost every release from you guys for the last 10 years that this might be the final final fate's warning uh album and this time you know naming 
the last song on this album, literally the last song, didn't yeah. sort of calm me down. Is there? Could you say something about that? Is is that something you? Well, um, I I think it's more probably something Jim would have to explain. But again, I think the last three albums that we did, Jim wasn't sure if he even wanted to do. Uh, the last two, I guess I should say, wasn't even sure if he wanted to do those. And, uh, and then, you know, we we had a lot of success and, and, and went on the road and had a great time. But uh, I, I personally, I just, I kind of think he's done uh, as far as writing. I think to him, I don't know. Again, you'd have to ask him. But uh, yeah. I really don't think that he wants to continue writing new music for Fate's Warning. But uh, as far as touring and uh uh as far as touring i guess yeah he's he still wants to do that we just talked a while back a couple of days ago and he's you know of course still ready to go on the road but uh, as far as new music yeah i think he doesn't uh, want to continue down that path i see yeah because i was thinking you know i heard about this also after tears of flight and then you had a very very successful tour with that and you know you you played with several dates with queens right last year and i I wonder if that sort of changed his mind when starting working on this album that well i think it changed i don't know if it changed all of our minds but maybe for him but again with with that album it was it was received so well and and by audience and, and 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 by um journalists never it was just received really really well and for them to say it was our best album in 25 years it was like what the, the fuck we've been doing wrong this whole time <laughs> and i yeah, i don't know but it, you know and then the touring was amazing man we had the biggest crowds and new places it was just such a good time and maybe that's what uh changed his mind for this one i'm not sure but uh, it was a successful album for all of us in every way possible you know, but um, I, I just don't know. Again, it's uh, it's we we've talked about it, but um, you know, we didn't really go into depth. I see. Uh, well, so I guess this is the kind of you know time will tell. You know, you guys yeah. want to go out, and you want to when the situation hopefully calms down. You want to go out and and you know play this album, and 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 of course, and then. What happens yeah, we'll going see. forward? Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, I want to ask a little bit about you know the beginning of your time in Fate's Warning, because No Exit that was your first album. Uh, yeah. So were you aware of the band before you you got the job, and you know what was your how was it coming into Fate's Warning at that point? Yeah, um, I was very aware. They were like one of my favorite bands. Actually, it was the funniest thing. Like, "Awaken the Guardian" was was like my favorite album, and um, I remember thinking uh, when I heard that John was no longer the band. Like to myself, I'm thinking, "Oh well, I'm never gonna listen to that band again." Like, who, who's ever gonna fill his shoes? You know, like he was Fate's Warning. You know, yeah. And and then I got the audition. I was like, no. Oh put my foot in my mouth and i took the job but it was um it was really really intimidating because again they were my favorite band i love what they did and you know the first day of rehearsal i remember uh, in connecticut i was a kid so i think i was 19 just about to turn 20 or 20 turning 21 i can't remember exactly but um the first day of rehearsal, you know, we're all in there and they're tuning up and everything. And Jim looks at me and goes, well, let's, let's see what you got. I was like, oh, shit. Okay, <laughs> here we go. Um, and at that point, I'd only really worked on one song, which was Quietus from The Irrigate of Dreams. That yeah. was the song I did for the demo for them. Um, and I think I'd worked on a couple of other little things by the time I got there. So then we just started working on new music together. And... Uh, I can't remember how long I was in the band before we were at the studio. It wasn't that long. Um, and I remember it was eight days in the studio to record No Exit. Um, back then, I had a lot of energy. I still you know, sing for 14 hours and get away <laughs> with it. But um, 
it was a great experience, you know, working with Roger Probert and Max Norman. And uh, it was just a great experience. Again, I was a kid. I'd never been out of the state of Texas when I joined the band. And all of a sudden, oh, here I am with my favorite band in the world recording in a studio, you know, like, and the music was really cool to me because it was so heavy. You know, I mean, the Guardian, everything, Spectre was really heavy, but this was a different, sort of a more modern sound, I think, to me. And I really dug it. And so I loved the direction that they were going in. And I couldn't even say we, because it was them. I was just joining, so. Well, I can't um, imagine, you know, coming into a band like that, that you were such a fan of, really. And then also having something like uh, the Ivory Gate of Dreams thrown at you. Must have been yeah. quite, uh, you know, uh, a challenge. It was an experience. Yeah, it was an experience. But you know, I I pulled it off somehow, um, and they liked it enough to put the album out, <laughs> keep me in the band. So, and, well, it, uh, well yeah. it is a fantastic album to me. That was the first album from you guys. I I actually bought and and I remember being being blown away by it. So so. <laughs> It's like it, it yeah. was like a new beginning for for the band in in many ways. Yeah, and again, it was so different than the other music than the other albums they had done. But I mean, like, no disrespect, because those albums are amazing. I still love them. I love Brocken. I mean, all the three yeah. albums they did with John are just fantastic. I don't know, beautiful. They're just amazing albums. His melodies are fucking insane, and his harmonies, and just the a whole. The, the whole thing was just amazing. The, the fact that Brocken was a demo and Metal Blade put it out, it still fascinates me. I'm still blown away by that, that the music writing was was that good. You yeah, know, because, they were kids. Because that was <laughs> written while the band still was called Misfit, right? Or, and, yeah. yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. So, so yeah, we're yeah. very, very you know, young people creating this amazing music. And, uh, yeah. yeah. I so, mean, it really is incredible that, that 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 was a demo, and, and you know, I guess they remixed it and put it back out, or just remastered. I'm not sure, but you know, it just reminds me of you know, like Def Leppard, how young they oh, were. Yeah. They put oh, out yeah. High and Dry, which to me is it's in my top five albums of all time. Still to this day, I fucking love that album. <laughs> and, the, and those guys were kids, man, and they wrote music that is just timeless. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's just some people just have magic. You know, it just it just happens. Sometimes it's rare, but it happens. Yeah, I, I think you know. Uh, I wanted to ask you know about uh, in this this beginning around the, the time of Awaken the Guardian and No Exit when you came into the band and of course a Perfect Symmetry coming after you guys sort of created the foundation for what I would say is progressive metal today. So. How did that come about? What were the inspirations that that led into that style and 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 kick started really a, a whole genre in a way? I honestly don't know. Again, I, I wish Jim were here to 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 chime in, but you know, it was Jim and Frank writing back then, and that that was just something that they had come up with. I mean, whatever they were influenced by, but you know, they they love everything. You know, they. You know, I used to joke around and call it old man music, you know, when they put <laughs> stuff on the bus and like, I don't want to hear that. But, you know, I'm going to appreciate it now. You know, J Jethro Tull and, uh, you know, I don't know, Sin Lizzy and, and just the, the usuals, you know. Yeah, Rush, Judas I would Priest, Black Sabbath, you know, kids throwing everything into one pot and seeing what comes out. Um, so I, I would attribute it to their their influence what they were influenced by as kids and writing their own music you know like but um yeah i i, I hear that all the time the progressive metal stalwarts well, um uh, godfathers <laughs> that's 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 what i always it's funny. Call, call you guys i, I say that yeah the, the true godfathers well, I guess, of progressive I guess, metal yeah yeah it's an honor that i guess yeah it's uh it's funny never thinking 35 years later we'd still be here you know doing this it's crazy i got a like yeah. uh, i got a quick question from someone in a uh, uh the fates warning fan group he said you know uh it's been five years since you released that special deluxe edition of uh pleasant shade so is this connected gonna get the same treatment he was very <laughs> he wanted to know um i don't know maybe i mean i 
I honestly don't even know where these whole things begin. It might be from the mind of Brian Slagle that yeah. wants to reintroduce these things to the world. Um, uh, I, I think it's mostly on Brian and he brings it up to Jim and that's how it comes about, you know, um, like the reissues of no exit, uh, and inside out, hmm. uh, on the new vinyl and everything. Uh, and the fantastic bonus, uh, you know, the bonus material with a lot of historical yeah. content. It's been really something treat for the fans too. So, so I think people Dude, are looking forward to We have so more. much of that stuff laying around. I mean, every demo we've ever done is usually archived. We keep all that stuff. I mean, Jim has cassettes still from from in the old days when I would record demos on, on a four track cassette player. That's, <laughs> you know, before pro tools, before people had studios. And I, um, unfortunately the last, I think it was theories of flight. Um, all that demo stuff was on my old Mac and like an idiot, I didn't get a hard drive to keep mm. it on. I just, I just dumped all the vocals and things on too. Uh, a stick. I just put it onto a USB yeah, stick, yeah. And, and then uh, I don't know, a month or two or three ago, I was <coughs> gonna. I got a new computer, and I was gonna put everything and see, just check it out. And the disc is fucked. It doesn't work. Oh, so it was like 120 gigs of, of uh, stuff, demos and <laughs> outtakes, and yeah, yeah. yeah well, gone. that's that's so. almost like it's everything is easier now with you know the everything on hard drives and and sticks and computers. But at the same time, you know. Those old uh, <laughs> tapes and yeah. everything, they seem to I, last. And, and they're also, they're so big that you can't really lose them in a way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, you'll keep them somewhere. It was I, a real drag because I've never had one of those things dump on me before. No. I've never had that. And the, the one important one just doesn't work. And I remember exactly. running to my wife and like, look, I'm like honey, <laughs> it doesn't work. Cause she's like, well, here, here, give it to me. And she was trying to mess with it. And she's like, yeah, yeah it's, it's gone. I'm like, no. So, I mean, I think, a lot of it's still on the other hard drive, but that was, you know, I was just cleaning my computer, getting exactly. it off, and now it's gone forever. So, yeah, whatever. What are you well, gonna do? I think you guys should. Uh, you know, there are fans out there like me that are interested in hearing just about anything you guys have lying around. So, so yeah, we have you, plenty of that. You should, you should just keep on rolling it out, and, and we're gonna <laughs> pick it up and and enjoy it. Yeah. Well, Jim definitely has all that stuff. He keeps all that. A lot of outtakes in the studios and things like that. He has. He has. So, yeah, maybe that'll... Uh, it's always fun. It's fun for me as well. So, we'll see. Maybe one day. Yeah, so I want to thank you for being on the broadcast. This was really, uh, really nice to be able to talk to you about about the album, a little bit about the history. And I want to wish yeah, you guys well. good you. luck with uh, the release of Long Day, Good Night. It's going to be out on November 6th, right? So yeah, that, yeah. Sh that should yeah. be good. It's a Friday, so everyone yeah. enjoy it. Have, have, sit down with a beer or wine or whiskey. A nice 15-year-old scotch, <laughs> which is good. And some, some which really, I, uh, really good I think music. I will. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully everyone likes it. Really, like I said, it's 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 a long album, but I, I would imagine hopefully people get their money's worth. So uh, I, I I just I hope people enjoy it. They do. Yeah, well, I I certainly did. Thank you so much for talking to me, Ray. You're very welcome, man. Take care. Okay. The podcast is a production of Stuist Media and is presented by the Prague Space. It is produced by Randy M. Salo. Janine Stengel Lewis, Blake Lewis, and Dario Albrecht. Our theme music is by This Is Not an Elephant, and Van Kirsch does our graphics. New episodes of the podcast drop every Monday and Thursday. And don't miss our Friday Top 5 episode where we discuss our favorite new releases from that week. For more interviews and reviews in the written form, check out theprogspace.com. <laughs>